Hello and welcome to another episode of Underworld Diary. If you have been enjoying the stories told on this channel feel free to hit the like and subscribe buttons below and help the channel grow. Now onto today's bonus episode. In this episode, we will take a look into the criminal career that allegedly inspired the creation of the popular Queen of the South TV show. The alleged source of this inspiration is the life and crimes of the Queen of the Pacific, Sandra Avila Beltran. Sandra would live a lavish lifestyle as an alleged Mexican drug queen pin, which drew the attention of both law enforcement and the international media. In a predominantly male-dominated illicit industry, the rise and success of Sandra's organization sparked public intrigue. Currently battling this growing intrigue, Sandra is in legal battles with Netflix, demanding royalties for the alleged portrayal of her image and life story. By female protagonist Teresa, in the Netflix original show, Queen of the South, this battle is still ongoing with some pointing out the similarities between the two stories. To better understand these claims, we will take a full look into the criminal career of Sandra Beltran. Sandra was born in Baja, California, Mexico, in October 1960. She was born into a life of luxury, as her family was said to have close connections with organized crime and cartels throughout the area. Beltran would have familial ties to the once boss of the Guadalajara cartel. On top of this, some Mexican officials have alleged that she is a niece of the former founder and boss of bosses of the Guadalajara cartel, Felix Gallardo. With this connection as well as her parents' alleged connection to the world of drug trafficking, Sandra was quite literally born into a life of crime. Growing up in this environment would blur the lines between everyday life and the criminal underworld. Seeing not only drug dealings but also extreme violence in her upbringing the young Sandra would fall right into the family business. At the age of 13, she witnessed her first shootout, which would become commonplace, through her teenage years. Despite the daily violence and her friends' involvement with cartels throughout the area, Sandra would focus on her schooling and for a period of time get out of the family business. Being able to succeed in high school she would attend Universidad at Noma de Guadalajara with aspiration of becoming a journalist. However, while studying here Sandra's family business would catch up to her, as she would be kidnapped by her boyfriend, who is closely linked to the cartel. Taking her away from school, Sandra would reluctantly fall back into the criminal world. She tried to leave. With her family lineage, Sandra was able to jump right into the criminal world and quickly move up the ranks. Being backed by powerful members, Sandra would use her smarts, connections and personality to carve out a space for herself in the predominantly male-dominated industry. In an interview with The Guardian, Sandra stated that women in the cartel were quote never a fighting being or a person made of triumphs and achievements, going on to state that they were often used by high-ranking members solely for their bodies. Alvia would not want this fate and would do everything in her power to gain the same level of respect that men were given in the illicit industry. With this tough personality and ability to connect with high-ranking cartel members, Sandra would begin climbing up the criminal ladder, allegedly starting to traffic large quantities of cocaine. She would allegedly develop a method of trafficking cocaine on tuna boats. Hiding large shipments in these boats she would allegedly be able to move millions of dollars worth of cocaine every month. This would give her the nickname, the Queen of the Pacific. She would strengthen her network over the years through her relationships, with high-ranking members of both the Colombian and Mexican cartels acting as a mediator between the two powerful organizations. This position allowed her to hold a vital role in the drug trafficking world and saw her earn millions each year. With the money came respect and power, giving her the status of her high-ranking male counterparts. Being able to rise to the top of the cartel, Alvia began bringing in millions for herself and living the lavish lifestyle her parents once had. However, as the case goes for most gangsters, with power and money comes attention, this attention would first come from rivals in the area that would allegedly attempt multiple hits on Sandra herself. Being able to survive these, Sandra would continue operating her illicit business until the early 2000s. At this time, Sandra's family would start to experience backlash from her rivals as well. This would start with her husband being killed, followed by her brother being tortured to death. Both are alleged to be tied to rival cartels. These horrific murders would then be followed by the kidnapping of her son. The kidnappers would demand $5 million from Sandro in exchange for releasing her son. Sandro would quickly pay this ransom getting her son back. This, however, would turn out to be the beginning of the downfall of Sandra. 
as the Mexican authorities would immediately become curious as to how Sandra was able to pay this expensive ransom. This would lead to an intensive investigation into the business dealings of Sandra, leading to the authorities looking to press charges against Sandra. Before the authorities could rest the queen pin she would go on the run. Sandra would go on the run for five years, a time she would later describe as extremely tiring. During this time she would be placed on the list of most wanted criminals in the country, with the authorities increasing their efforts to detain her. After years on the run, Albia would finally be caught in 2007 and sent to jail. After being on the list of Mexico's most wanted, the Mexican government was happy to announce the capture of the Queen of the Pacific. This capture would be followed by Sandra being sentenced to seven years in prison for conspiracy of drug trafficking and organized crime-related charges. She would be sent to a Mexican prison to serve these charges. Serving this time in Mexico would be a huge stroke of luck for the Queen Pin, as she would later state that money buys everything in Mexico alleging that while in prison she would be allowed to have visitors, designer clothes and even maids. She was able to breathe through her prison sentence until 2012 when the U.S. fought for extradition. This would result in Sandra being moved to a U.S. federal prison later that year. She would remain in prison until 2013 when she pleaded guilty to being an accessory after the fact in a drug trafficking operation and was sentenced to 70 months in jail. Being released from prison in 2015, Sandra has looked to stay away from her previous criminal life, going on interviews to speak about the corruption that plagues Mexico. Her story shows how a smart and driven woman was able to not only enter into, but hold a position of power in the violent male-dominated world of crime. Growing up surrounded by crime, Sandra experienced violence that would follow her throughout her life. Not running from this violence, Sandra would double down and look to carve out her own peace in the Mexican underworld. A story that is alleged to inspire TV shows and movies. It's truly a remarkable story that is starting to become more commonplace in the evolving world of organized crime. Thank you for watching another episode of Underworld Diary. If you enjoy the stories told on this channel, click the like and subscribe button down below. If you have any topics you'd like to see covered in future videos, feel free to leave a comment. If not, I will see you next episode with another story from the Underworld.